Morning. Okay, we are going to continue in the book of Hebrews. Um, I have a lot to cover today. As a matter of fact, I don't even know if I'll get it all covered, so I'll try to move as quickly as possible through this brief recap. But uh, Hebrews uh, was written to a group of Jewish believers who had converted uh, to Christianity. Uh, and since converting, they had been heavily persecuted by their own countrymen. Uh, and they were being persecuted because they wanted them to return to the practice of the law with still you know, worshiping Jesus, which obviously... God would not have been pleased with. But they kept persecuting him and pushing them and pressuring him, so much so that uh, they actually started becoming tempted to comply. Now, they didn't, but they were very tempted to. So the author heard about this, and he wrote this to encourage them to stay the course. Uh, Because if they were returning to the law, um, they would be the same as agreeing with those who crucified Jesus. Now, today, I'm going to look at another comparison between Uh, Jesus and the Jewish priest. Now, I'm going to try to finish chapter 6 and preach all of chapter 7. But I don't know if we're going to get there, but we're going to give it a shot. So I titled today's message, uh, Better Than Before. So let's jump right in. So Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 13. It says, For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply you, And so, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. Now, in verses 13 through 15, the author was talking about Abraham's faithfulness while under duress. Remember, he's trying to talk these Hebrews into being faithful, even though they were being persecuted and being tempted. Well, this is what he he was using Abraham basically as an illustration, uh, and he was talking about Abraham's faithfulness while under duress, specifically when Abraham was tested by God about his son Isaac. Because in Genesis 22, God asked Abraham uh, to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Now, God had already promised Abraham that he would have many descendants numbered as the sands of the sea through this young man, Isaac. And he waited a long time to have this son. He was 100 when uh, when Isaac was born. And his wife was in her 90s. So we're talking he waited a long time patiently for this son. And now God was saying, I want you to kill him. Okay, so this is very difficult. So most people would have been angry with God or at least questioned what he was asking them to do. Now, I know we like to think that we're spiritual, but let's just be honest for a second. If God told you, kill your child, don't you think you might go, you might have the wrong number or something? You know what I mean? He didn't even question that. Abraham just responded by doing exactly what God asked without hesitation. So let's take a look at that. Genesis twenty-two three. It says, the next morning, Abraham got up early, and he saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac. Uh, then he chopped wood for a fire and burnt offering and set out for the place uh, God had told him about. This is pretty cool. I mean, a hundred-year-old guy, hundred and probably twenty at this time, is cutting wood. I don't know why I brought that up, but you're welcome. All right. <laughs> Verse 4. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw, a place, uh, and saw the place in the distance. Uh, Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called uh, to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Now, I've got to be tempted here not to preach those verses because there's so much in there to preach. But um, no, I just notice the depth of Abraham's faith. And you see it probably the most powerful uh, in verse 20, uh, or in verse 5, actually. He says, stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little bit farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. back. See, he didn't know how, but he knew that God was not going to permanently take his only son. He didn't know how, but he was absolutely willing to kill him. 
He just decided that if he killed him, as God said, God would raise him from the dead. Because he knew that God made a promise that hadn't been fulfilled in that son yet and that he was going to keep it. Sometimes I think we forget how much faith Isaac had to have. Because this old man did not wrestle him down on the top of that wood. I mean, he had to lay down and allow himself uh, to be tied to that pile of wood. So, I mean, we see unbelievable faith here. So much faith that he was willing to do something that seemed completely impossible because he believed in God's promises, right? So Abraham did everything God asked him to do with Isaac, but before he was able to kill him, and the Bible tells us he actually was drawing his knife back, God stepped in and stopped him. And because of Abraham's unfettered commitment to God, God swore an oath to him. If you look at Genesis twenty-two fifteen. 15. <coughs> It said, Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Behold, you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son. I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of your enemies. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. When he says all the nations of the earth will be blessed, that was a prophecy about Jesus. Because through Jesus, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So notice that God introduced these promises with an oath. right? And and with this oath, he swore this oath on himself. So the author was reminding the Hebrews of the importance here of being patient. Okay, That's why he brought all this up. Because he was reminding them that remaining faithful under pressure especially this pressure to return to the law, which they were making it sound like it wasn't that big of a deal. They're like, oh, you can still be a Jesus guy. Just, you know, do the sacrifices and stuff. They were trying to make it sound like no big deal. And he was saying, listen, remain faithful and don't give in to that pressure because being able to stand during a trial, being able to stand up and do what's right when you're being tempted is super important to your faith because God richly blesses those who stand for their faith even when it's difficult. He richly blessed Abraham for doing that, and he would richly bless them if they would stay faithful and not give in to all the persecution and all the pressure. Now, in verses 16 through 20, the author reminded the Hebrews of something really important. Look at this, verse 16. He says, For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given is confirmation to an... Well, I blew that completely apart. Okay. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with them an oath given as confirmation is an end of every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his, of his purpose, interposed with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil, where Jesus has entered uh, as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek. Okay, now, I'm going to go over oaths real quick, then we're going to spend some time on Melchizedek. Remember I told you that back in you know, earlier chapters, we'd spend some more time. Okay, and I'll try not to repeat myself. Probably will, but I'll try not to. Okay, so oaths back in were commonly used. Now, a lot of people say, I thought, you know, nowadays God tells us we're not supposed to make oaths. Listen, this is a different time. This is a different time frame. And oaths were used very commonly back then to highlight a commitment to a promise that was made. Okay, to highlight a commitment to a promise that was made. But oaths were only as good as the object of the oath that they swore it by. That's, that's how good the oath was. I mean, which, to put it in our context, would you believe your neighbor more if he said, I swear by your doghouse? Or would you believe him more if he said, I swear on my life? You see what I mean? The oath was only as powerful as the object the oath was made on, right? So the author's intent was to encourage his readers to have faith in times of trial. uh, And God made his oath to Abraham on himself because nothing is greater than God. And God didn't need to make an oath, I mean, because he's God and God doesn't lie. But he did so to emphasize his commitment to blessing Abraham for his faithfulness. God was just following along with the culture, if you will, and he was saying, I will bless you, and as sure as I am God, because he swore by himself, as sure as I am God, if you stay faithful, you can count on my promises. They will come true. And God's promises were the anchor of Abraham's faith, just as they should be for all of us. 
Because all believers, I don't know if you realize this, all of us are heirs to those promises that God has made to those who remain faithful, to those who believe and remain faithful. We are all uh, heirs to those promises. And those promises say that he will bless us in this life, in the kingdom to come, if we stay faithful, right? And I don't know if you've noticed, it's getting harder. It seems like the world is doing everything it can to pull you away from being faithful. Have you noticed that? I mean, it feels like, tell me if I'm wrong, it feels like that the world is trying to account for every second of your time so that you will not have any time left for God. How many times have you thought to yourself, gosh, I've barely read this week? How many times has that come to you? How many times have you thought, man, I haven't, I haven't had really any in-depth prayer. I just prayed out of obligation because I'm supposed to. Because I don't have time. The kids got to be this, and the, you know, me and my husband got to be there, and I got this meeting, and then you know, the kids have to go to this class, and then I have school and school events. It seems like the world is trying to pull people away from time that we need to get closer to God. And sometimes it actually feels like, I don't know if you guys have ever had that moment of lucidity where you feel like, Everything's closing in on you in the world. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever stopped in the middle of all your obligations and thought, I just feel like everything is coming in on me. I don't even know which way to go. I, there's so many people I don't want to disappoint. I want to be a good parent. I want to be a good friend. I want to be a good spouse. I want to be a good Christian. And every second of my time is accounted for. And it's, sometimes it just feels like the whole world is closing in on you. But we always need to remember, God is always watching over us, always watching over us, and he blesses those who remain faithful. But those blessings are going to come in his time. Okay, they're kind of going to come in his time. Notice he spent a lot of time talking about how Abraham was patient. I mean, he was praying for an heir for 100 years. Now think about this for a second. I don't even know how stoked his wife was to find out she was pregnant at 90. People go, oh, 90 was different back then. No. It was, this, it was old, right? If people saw a 90-year-old pregnant in Abraham's time, they're like, uh, that shouldn't be, right? So, I mean, he waited 100 years to have this son and remained faithful the whole time. And God always blesses us when we remain faithful. That's just the way he is, but it's going to be on his time. See, Abraham believes God promises even when everything looked impossible, and more than once. I wanted to preach through his whole life, but we'd have been here until the Lord came back. But um, (laughs) if you think about it, God called him when he was living in a pagan nation, serving pagan gods. Some believe his dad was an idol maker, right? And a voice comes to him and says, Abraham, follow me. And he recognized it as God and just got up and walked away from everything. That's great faith. Then Abraham says, I'm going to give you a son. And he waits a hundred years to get that son, you know. And then he gets a son. And as he's a young boy, God says, kill him. And he, I mean, I don't know if he could have picked a better example of faith than Abraham. And I'll be honest with you, I'm not that faithful. I mean, people, you can act spiritual if you want to, but if I heard a voice, I'd probably see a psychologist. I'm just throwing it out there. Because in this day and age, we're not open to hearing God like they used to be. We need to be more open to it. You know what I mean? If, if God said, you know, Chris, I'm going to bring you a son, and through that son, the nations will be blessed, I think when I pass 70, I'd be going, maybe I got someone else's mail. You know what I mean? When I hit 90, I'd be going, no, this ain't happening. When I hit 100, I'd already be making plans for my death. You know what I mean? And he waited for his son. God blesses people who are willing to wait, and it's always going to be on his time. Our faith really shines when we're willing to trust God, even when times are tough, even when we're waiting for an answer. It doesn't take great faith to pray and boom, it happens. right? It takes great faith to pray and believe it's going to happen. And wait for it. That takes great faith. You know, if we give up because we don't understand what God's doing, is that even faith? Did you ever even exercise faith? You know what I mean? I have people call me all the time, and one of the first questions out of their mouth is, What is God doing? And I'm like, Well, He didn't send me an email. I don't know. (laughs) Well, I prayed this, and He's just not answering me. How long ago did you pray it? A week ago. I'm like, I've had to wait a week on stuff from Amazon for crying out loud. 
You know what I mean? And you're giving up on God after a week? I think what happens is a lot of times, unlike Abraham, Abraham's anchor, it says that he was his anchor. Abraham's anchor was believing in the hope that comes. And the word hope, as LPs mean confidence, the confidence knowing that God would answer his prayers. That was the anchor to his soul. Even when everything else was going crazy, he's like, I know, but God is faithful. He was willing to wait. He was patient because he knew that God in his time will bless. And I think the reason a lot of people don't know that today is we give in before God's time. We give in because he's not working on our time. That's why that happens. Now, Hebrews 7, 1 through 10. It says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, uh, to whom also Abraham appointed a tenth part of the spoils, uh, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, he remains a priest perpetually. Now, observe how great this man was whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the choicest spoils. And those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's offerings have a commandment in the law to collect a tenth from the people, that is, uh, from their brethren, although these are descendants from Abraham. But the one whose generosity is not traced from them collected a tenth from Abraham, blessed the one who had the promises. But without any dispute, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In this case, mortal man receives tithes. Now remember that said mortal man receives tithes. But in that case, one receives them, of whom it is a witness that he lives on. And, so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, who received tithes, paid tithes. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. He's saying that the priest even paid tithes to Melchizedek because the priest came from the lineage of Abraham. So they even paid tithes through Abraham. So before Abraham was called Abraham, he was known as Abram. So whenever you see those two names, realize it's the same person. And now Genesis 14 speaks of a, of a king named Ketorleomer. I think I said that right. Ketorleomer. That's it. Ketorleomer. That's it. I take the homer out of there. <laughs> and he was a very, very powerful king. But he was also a bully. Okay? And he demanded tribute from all the weaker kingdoms. All right, and I'm leading you up to where he met Melchizedek, all right? And after 12 years of this bully king taking tribute from these other weaker kingdoms, they got sick of it. You know, the bully on the playground, sooner or later, you're going to push somebody too far and they're going to come out swinging, right? Well, they got sick of it. So they finally said, I'm not paying this tribute anymore. We are not paying this tribute anymore. And among those who were sick of it were the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, uh, the kingdoms who'd had enough, all these, these kingdoms who were sick of it, they band together and decided to rebel. Genesis 14, 14 says, For 12 years uh, they had been subject to King Keterolamor, or whatever. We're just going to call him K. But in the 13th year, they rebelled against him. Now, but some of the other kings in the area who at first said they were sick of it, changed their mind when they said, we're going to go to battle with him. You know, people talk tough until it's time for action. You ever notice that? So all these kings are together playing euchre or whatever they're doing, and they're like, we're done. We're going to fight back, and they're all going, yeah. But I think some of them thought it was just tough talk over a, you know, over a good time. When they got together and said, we're actually going to put this into, you know, this attack into, into play, some of them backed out. And not only did they back out, the ones who didn't join them sided with their oppressor. They sided with this bully king. So it ended up being four kingdoms on the bully king side, and five kingdoms with the rebels. So they actually had more kingdoms than he did in this battle. So they went to battle with him, with the bully king. Look at Genesis 14, 8. It says, Then the rebel uh, kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Ama, Zeboim, and Bela, also called Zoar, uh, prepared for battle in the valley of the Dead Sea. They fought against uh, King K of, El <laughs> of Elam, King Tidel of Goan, King Amraphel uh, of Babylonia and King Arioch of Eleazar, for, uh, four kings against five. As it happened, the valley of the dead was filled with tar pits. And as the army of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled 
some fell into the tar pits while the rest escaped to the mountains. So you know that the rebels didn't win. Okay. Verse 11, the victorious invaders then plundered Sodom and Gomorrah and headed for home, taking with them all the spoils of war and the food supplies. Verse 12, they also captured Lot, Abraham's nephew who lived in Sodom, uh, and carried off everything he owned. But one of Lot's men escaped and reported everything to Abraham, the Hebrew, uh, who was living near the oak uh, grove belonging to Mamre, the Amorite. And Mamre and his relatives, Eschol and Aner, uh, were Abram's allies. So despite having one less kingdom, being outnumbered basically with kingdoms, the bully king won and the other kings ran. And while they're running away, some of them fell into the pits that were in the valley, some of them from Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I wanted to preach more on this because there's something here, but I don't have time. But I just want you to think about it. Now, think about this. There are these tar pits right in the region of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay? Imagine how those tar pits would burn when later God sends fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. They talked about how hot and how long they burned. There were tar pits all around those cities. So not only was it raining fire, it was raining fire on these, these pits of tar uh, that would, man, I can't even imagine how long this thing would burn. But ironically, the people who fell into the tar pits were the ones from Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm not going to preach on that right now, but I'm just saying, okay, there's something there, but that's another sermon. So after defeating the five kings, the bully king here plundered Sodom and Gomorrah. And he also took some prisoners, now one of which was Abraham's nephew, Lot. Okay, as we're going to soon see, this was a big mistake. Everything else he did was pretty inconsequential. But he took the nephew of a man who was very favored by God. He took his nephew and took everything he had. And he wasn't going to get away with it because one of Lot's men actually escaped and found Abraham, or Abram at the time, and told him what happened. So Abram attacked this bully king. Now think about this. Before I read this, five kingdoms could not beat the bully kingdom. Five of them. Five kingdoms and their armies could not defeat this bully king. So Abraham is going to go to war with him to rescue his nephew with 318 men. I don't know if they were like Jewish Green Berets. I don't know if they were Navy SEALs. I don't know if they were Marines. I don't know what they were. 318 of them, right? So I just think of 318 Jason Bournes, and if you don't know who that is, shame on you. <laughs> just throwing it out there. If you don't know who Jason Bourne is, Kevin will come at you angry with a tear running down his face. <laughs> anyway, so he attacks him. Genesis 14, 14 through 16. When Abram heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, now notice nothing caught his attention till that. When Abram heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, he mobilized the 318 trained men who had been born into his household. Then he pursued the bully king, Keterolamer, uh, army until he caught up with him at Dan. There he divided his men and attacked during the night. Uh, Keterolamer's army fled, but Abram chased them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. Abraham recovered all the goods that had been taken, and he brought back his nephew Lot with his possessions and all the women and other captives. Okay, so it's obvious that God was with Abraham because he did with 318 men what five armies could not do. He went in strategically at night and attacked them and whipped their butt. That's the Chris Mosley version, right? <laughs> and not only did he whip them, he took everything they took. And my assumption was everything else they had also, right? Because that was the way it worked back then. You got the spoils of war. So he rescues his nephew, uh, and his family, and brings him back. So if there's one thing this should remind us of, it's that those who depend on God are never outnumbered. We are never outnumbered. You, sometimes you feel that way. Do you notice that? I mean, that, life said this a million times, but I, just, I can't stand to watch national news because, I mean, if you watch it, you will feel outnumbered. Because the world has lost its dang mind. You know what I mean? And when you watch the news, you're like going, is everybody crazy? Am I the only one that thinks that? I'm not kidding, and I won't even, I have these weird habits, I won't even let, which shouldn't shock anybody, but I don't, I won't even let my TV settle on the news. When I know it's coming next, I will change it, because I'm afraid I'm one of the Nielsen households, and I don't want them to get my rating. So I won't, that's how much I don't watch them. But, 
<laughs> I'm just saying. But honestly, when I, do, when I was watching it, every day I felt depressed. I felt like I was ganged up on by the world. But one thing I have to remember is me and God outnumber everybody. Amen. That's just the way it is. Me and God, when you are with God, you outnumber everybody. Because God fights for and fights with those who are willing to fully depend on him. He always has and he always will. But anyway, now on his way back from the battle, let me check my time. On his way back from the battle, uh, Abram met some, uh, someone that was both powerful and mysterious. Okay, Genesis 14, 17. It says, after Abram returned from his victory over Keter Loremor uh, and all his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the, or, sorry, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and a priest of God most high, brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods that he had recovered. So this man Abram met was named Melchizedek. You knew this was coming, right? And it says that he was both a priest and a king. A priest and a king. And it's important to note that all this happened before the law. This happened before the Levitical or Aaronic priesthood. That's when all this happened. There was no law. Moses had not brought the law yet, okay? As a matter of fact, this was about 600 years before Moses even came on the scene, right? Yet Abraham recognized Melchizedek as a king and a priest. How? I, mean, I really don't know 100% the answer to that because the priesthood that the Jews were familiar with didn't exist yet. So how did he recognize him as a priest when the office of priest was introduced through the law? You know, so somehow he recognized he was a king. He knew he was a king of Salem and he recognized that he was a priest of the most high God. Now, when Melchizedek saw Abram, he brought him bread and wine and blessed him, Right. Which makes me think where Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and the wine represents the joy that he brings into your life. There could be something there, but I'm not going to preach that right now. But anyway, you don't realize how hard this was to weed out what to actually preach on today. Uh, but anyway, he brought the blood, bread and wine, then he blessed him. So Abraham gave him 10% of everything he just plundered, or a tithe. That's what a tithe means. Again, this was before the law. So he gave him 10% before God ever said, you should give 10% to the people under the law. This was not commanded for him to give 10%. This was a free will offering that Abram made out of respect for the king of Salem that he recognized. Now, let me get this out of the way. As I said the last time we talked about Melchizedek, this was a real person. Now, people always try to spiritualize him and say that this was, you know, this was Jesus that he met and that that's why they never saw him again. No, he was a real person uh, and he did exist. He was a real king. And people say, then what does it mean when it says having no father or mother or beginning days or end of days? Uh, and here's what that meant. That meant there were no records of him. That's what that meant. They weren't saying he was immaculate conception born. What they were saying is they didn't know his past and they didn't know his future. They knew that God put him there at that instance and that time for a reason. Everything else they didn't know, right? And God did that to show that this Melchizedek was a type of Christ or a pre-incarnate look of what Christ would do. That's what he was. And he wanted him to come in that same mysterious type uh, setting where he came in different than everything everyone knew, blessed them, and left. That's kind of what they're talking about. Now, there are literally no records about Melchizedek whatsoever. You can't find records about his birth. You can't find records about his death or anything he accomplished during his reign. You just can't find any information about that, which doesn't matter. That's neither here nor there. But... We know we don't hear about him again after this for a thousand years. And this is when David mentioned him in Psalm 110. Look at this, Psalm 110. Starting verse 4, it says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So the order of Melchizedek basically means the pattern of Melchizedek. So you are a priest patterned after Melchizedek's priesthood. 
right? And in Psalm 101, he was talking about the Messiah, Jesus. He was talking about that comparison. So what is the pattern of Melchizedek? It was a special God-ordained priesthood that had nothing to do with religion. This is a priesthood that could not be linked to a religion of any kind, right? This was a God-ordained priesthood with nothing to do with religion, a priesthood that was not according to the law and not according to any Jewish or any religious uh, traditions, right? And his name meant king of righteousness, and it also meant king of peace because he was king of Salem, and Salem means peace. So in the Hebrew, the word Salem is the word Shalom, and Shalom means peace, but this is cool. Okay, so Melchizedek was king of righteousness and king of peace, but later Salem would be known as Jerusalem, and the Hebrew word for Jerusalem is Yerushalayim. That's the Hebrew word, Yerushalayim. And the meaning of Jerusalem begins with that core word, Shalayim, right? The meaning of Jerusalem begins with that. So it means that Shalayim actually means completeness or wholeness. Completeness or wholeness. The word Shalom comes from Shalayim. And Shalom means peace, right? Right now. I'm getting a little, chasing this down a little much, but the prefix Yeru for Jerusalem means they will see and they will be in awe. In the Hebrew, it means they will see and they will be in awe. So Jerusalem can literally mean they will see and be in awe of the completeness, wholeness, and peace. So who is this talking about, being in awe of the completeness, wholeness, and peace. Even the name Jerusalem points to Jesus. Even the name Jerusalem points to Jesus. And they will see it and they will be in awe. And Philippians 2 tells us about how they'll be in awe and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. They will be in awe of the completeness because he will come and complete the law. Right? Make null the law. Null and void. All right? Now, for time constraints, I guess I'm going to move on. Okay. Hebrews 7.11 says, now, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? For when the priesthood is changed, of necessity there takes place a change of law also. For the one concerning whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no one has officiated the altar, or means no one has been a priest from. For it is evident that our Lord was a descendant from Judah, or descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. So he's saying there's never been a priest out of the tribe of Judah, right, before this. So in verses 11 through 14, the author was pointing out how Psalm 110 was a psalm about change. Because a psalm about change, and that's what he was quoting in those verses in Hebrews 7. So David wrote this psalm about one, uh, about a thousand B.C. Okay, so he wrote this Psalm 110 around 1,000 B.C. And Moses brought the law around 1446 B.C. Okay, so David wrote this psalm around 400 years after the law was given at Mount Sinai, right? And the topic of this psalm was to announce that the current priesthood was flawed because it was only temporary. It was flawed. He was speaking, of course, of the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. And the reason it was flawed is it was temporary and it was incapable of bringing perfection, which is what he said there. And by perfection, he meant that the current priesthood could not bring eternal life. You had to go back year after year on the, on the Day of Atonement, year after year, right? So that's why it could not bring perfection. Now, this new priesthood would be one they'd never heard of, right? Because the new priesthood would be after the order of Melchizedek. Now, the Hebrews had only ever heard of the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood. But today we know that the new priesthood he was talking about was Jesus. That's what he was talking about in that. Now, Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. And he was saying it's a totally different priesthood. It not only null and voids the old priesthood, it's a totally different one. The law never said someone from Judah could be a priest. And the reason was he wasn't from the line of Judah. He wasn't after the order of Judah. He was after the order of, you can answer that. 
Melchizedek. He was after the order of Melchizedek. It was a totally different priesthood, totally different priesthood. He was simply trying to tell, tell his readers that the old priesthood was never intended to bring eternal life, and only through this new priesthood could anyone have eternal life, or through Jesus. And this new priesthood didn't just appear out of the blue, because that's what the Jews were saying. What's this stuff he's teaching? None of this is in the law. This doesn't follow the, the Aaronic or the Levitical priesthood. What is the stuff Jesus is teaching? He wasn't teaching stuff from the priesthood of Aaron or the priesthood of Levi. It didn't work for eternal life. But he wasn't just showing up out of nowhere. David talked about this priesthood in Psalm 110, hundreds of years before Jesus was born. So if they had been paying attention and really looking for their Messiah, they would have seen that when they were looking uh, at, the, at the Psalms, right? So basically knowing this, he was saying, now that I've told you all this, maybe you should rethink going back into the law because I've proven to you it's worthless. Why would you want to go back to a law that's both ineffective and obsolete? And I tell you what's equally frustrating is why do we today choose things with no eternal value over Jesus? That's what kept going through my mind when I was preparing this message. I was putting a lot of facts down, looking at a lot of stuff, and I thought, you know, you sit here and think to yourself, man, they, they were crazy. Why didn't they see? Why would they put anything over Jesus? Then it rushes to my mind like God saying, hold up there, Mr. Self-Righteous. Would you like me to list all the things you've put over Jesus in the past? Would you like me to list the things you're still putting over Jesus? Yeah, believe me, it's in our nature to want to put things over Jesus. Then when we end up in trouble or in the midst of a tragedy, we find out those things just can't help us. Now, I'm just going to read this last part. I don't really have time to cover much of it, but Nate will probably have to come back next week and cover over this again. But look at Hebrews 7, 15 through 24. Oh, wow. I don't even know if I have time for that. Oh, well, we'll give it a shot. Here we go. Okay, so in verses 15 through 24, the author kind of explains the difference between temporary and eternal priesthood. It says, And this is clearer still, if, any, if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become such, not on the basis of law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life, for it is attested of him, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is, a setting, there is a setting aside of the former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better type through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as it was not without an oath, for if they indeed became priests without an oath, uh, but with an oath through the one who uh, said to them, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever." So much uh, the more also Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The former priest on, the, on one hand existed in greater numbers because they were uh, prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. So the reason basically, and I'm going to do this quickly, basically saying the reason there were so many high priests was they were failing. There were so many high priests because high priests couldn't live forever. They couldn't bring eternal life. You had to go back every year to get uh, atonement, and they couldn't bring it. And then by the time they got to their aid, they were hindered by death. They all had to die. Then the next one would take over, and he couldn't do it either. Then the next one would take over, and he couldn't bring it. The next one would take over. And basically what he was saying is there's no victory over death through people who are still subject to it. Right? Those priests were still subject to death. They were going to die. He's saying, but Jesus, after being crucified, defeated death so that he could give what the law couldn't, eternal life once and for all, which again is why I'm so passionate about eternal security. To say that you have to go back and do it over and over again, you, and this is what the author was saying, you might as well kept the law, right. right? Why did we need another priesthood? If the first one worked, it didn't. That's why we needed a new priesthood, and that new priesthood is Jesus. I'm going to go ahead and stop there because I'm not going to push it. Okay, I'm going to ask you to please bow your heads. If this is your first time, we always like to give a brief invitation. If there's someone here who'd like prayer, just make eye contact me. Put your head right back down. Bless those people. Bless those people. And I will be praying. Bless those people. Bless those people. Listen, if you're watching or listening online, God knows your heart. I'll be praying for you. But believers, you know, when I read through these things, the one thing that jumps out to me is where are the people who are as passionate as Abraham about Jesus? Why can't we be that way? And the answer is we can but it takes laying down the things that don't matter and picking up the things that do. Let's pray. 
God, I thank you so much for all that you do. I'm just so thankful for the gift of salvation. I'm thankful that it's free. I'm thankful, God, we didn't have to become good enough because we never could be. I'm so thankful that all we had to do was trust in Jesus and what he did for our eternal life, and your word guarantees it to us. I can't understand the kind of love that would love people as flawed as we are, people who are continually sinful. But I'm so thankful that love exists, and I'm thankful that you gave it to us. I just pray for someone here who doesn't know you, whatever's holding them back, remove it so that they might believe this great promise and join into this great eternal family. And God, for those of us who are already believers, remind us what matters. Because all the things will be gone someday. All the possessions, all the power, all the notoriety will be gone someday. But someday, we will stand before you. And none of those things are going to matter. What's going to matter is what we've done for you while we were here. Give us a passion to serve you so that we would all be faithful enough to serve in that kingdom. Give us a passion to draw our family and friends and coworkers closer to you through the way we show them your love. Make us the kind of effective believer that changes the world. And we just pray, God, that as we leave here, you'd keep us safe. And if you don't return to take us home before we get the opportunity to meet again, we just pray we come together and give you all the praise and glory you're so worthy of at least one more time. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.